Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't think many of you realize how important you actually are. I think some of us are ashamed of ourselves. And so we shame ourselves and it ends up in passivity. On the other hand, some of us are arrogant. Some of us, even though we wouldn't admit it, think we're doing God a favor by walking into church on Sunday morning. Whether you tend on the spectrum to be more of the passive and apathetic or the arrogant and the obnoxious, wherever you are on that spectrum, you are, every single one of you, of supreme importance to God. So important are you. So beloved are you, regardless of, again, where on the spectrum your sins are, so important are you, so beloved are you, that in the fullness of time, God became a man, fully God and fully man in the flesh, to stand in your place, in our place, to live an immaculate, perfect life for you, and ultimately, to suffer the punishment that we know we deserve for our apathy or for our arrogance. This is the, the purpose of God's coming. You are so beloved that God sent His Son for you to die for you and to rise for you. That, that is how important, seriously, how important each and every one of you are. And how you live is important. Right? Your life is important. St. James, in chapter 2 of his letter, puts it this way. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, that is, if they basically don't have anything to wear and they're starving, and one of you says, Go in peace to be warm and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? That is to say, if someone is starving, someone in your realm of influence, right, and, and you have the ability, and you say, well, sorry. Well, next verse, my translation. So faith, if it does not act in love, is in and of itself not faith at all. It's actually just dead. Faith that does not act in love is really just vanity and lip service. Friends, today, the Lord Jesus opens our ears to hear God's Word that we might trust Him and confess our sins and have His forgiveness and then, and then live a life of faith. And in truth, this account that we just heard in Mark chapter 7 between Jesus and this deaf, mute man, in, in many respects, this is a summary of how salvation is and how a life in Christ is. And and so, let's dig in. By the way, so I provided the whole text for you in pieces in your sermon notes if you want to follow along. We're told that Jesus was going from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon. That means Jesus was over by the Mediterranean Sea in, in ancient Philistine territory, the territory of the ancient enemies of the people of Israel. So whenever you see Jesus in Gentile territory, Jesus is going about proving that he is, in fact, the Savior, not just of the Jews, but of the whole world, just as God had promised to Adam and Eve at the beginning and then reiterated through the centuries, in particular to Abraham. 
Through you, one of your descendants, Abraham, through you, all the peoples, not just some, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. So Jesus heads through Philistine territory, inland to the Sea of Galilee, and then east to the region of the Decapolis, ten cities in kind of a mixed pagan, religious, and mixed ancestry region. And then we're told, they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Do you notice it? They brought him. They brought him. Some people, his family, his friends, they loved him enough to bring him to Jesus. And that, friends, is how it is for all of us. Last night we had a baptism, so a perfect example, right? Whether as an infant, that is the case for most of us, but not necessarily for all of us. But at some, whether you came as an infant or some, sometime along, someone brought the Word of God to you. Someone, some people brought you to Jesus because they loved you enough to introduce Him to you that He might bless you. Now look what happens next. Taking Him aside from the crowd privately, Jesus put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, then touched his tongue. The spitting thing is hard to explain. But the interaction between Jesus and this man, if you think about it in the context, is stunning. Again, parents, remember when you first held that little baby or sometime afterwards, right, at a moment of celebration or whatever, you held your child right, right in arm's length and looked at him right together. I think we have, a, we have a tendency to view Jesus as this great cosmic lawgiver and stern and harsh. But Jesus is actually described, and he can be that if he has to be. But that is not the essence of Jesus. Right? Jesus is full of compassion and love. And in fact, in his ministry, he is about, he is doing, fulfilling what the, what the Old Testament had prophesied of him. He is bringing sight to the blind and, and hearing to the deaf and, and healing of all sorts. He is full of compassion to restore the creation that is so broken. And so he takes this man aside and imagine Jesus, not sternly, but he's got his hands and look at him right in the face, right, with love and joy because, right, the Savior of the world is right in front of this man. And then he takes him, next verse, right, and looking up into heaven, he says, Epitha, be opened. And all of a sudden, the man can hear again and speak by the way, he's described as, as, as deaf but, with a, but slow of speech or with an impediment, which implies that he may have had hearing in the past but lost his hearing subsequently and so had difficulty making right. And now, so he may have memory of this. Now all of a sudden he can speak. You ever seen these videos of the infants or toddlers that are born with a hearing impairment? and they get the cochlear implant. Right? If you haven't seen one of these, go home today after Bible study. Right? Go home today and search it out and look. You will see this beautiful little child and their world is silent and then all of a sudden, it explodes with love. That is what you should picture here with Jesus and this man, right? And so then Jesus, I mean, curiously tells him, right, don't tell anybody about this. Now, it appears in the context of the Scriptures that Jesus, earlier, early in his ministry, doesn't want the religious authorities and the, the rulers to find out about what he's doing because he knows that when, when they get threatened enough, 
they're going to kill him. He knows that has to happen eventually, but it, it seems that he's, he's wanting to camp this down so he can go about and go about the work of love that, that he is. But so he tells them, don't, right, don't tell anybody. But they can't not. It's like that little baby when the, when the, when the, when the ears are turned on, he, can, he can't not speak and make noise. When we, when we when we receive the forgiveness of Christ, we can't not speak of it. And friends, this is what God does for you in your baptism. Baptism is, is not just something we do because Jesus told us to. Not, not God's response to something we do. Right? The Scriptures say The Scriptures say, for example, Peter, in his great Pentecost sermon, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children. It's for all. Your baptism is an adoption ceremony. It It is God claiming you as his own and taking you up into the very life of God, forgiving you and setting you free. Right? This is, right, how could we not speak of this? That's what God does for us. And by the way, if you're here today and you haven't been baptized, Pastor Shockman or I would love to talk to you about baptism, right? It, and the joy and promises of it. Friends, the, the, what we heard earlier from Isaiah is fulfilled Isaiah said, say to those who have an anxious heart. Does anybody here have an anxious heart? Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance and the recompense of God. He will save you. That promise is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. (laughs) The recompense of God, the punishment of God, it, it, it was meted out on Jesus. Jesus received it. And he delivers then his eternal forgiveness to you. Whether you are ashamed of yourself and apathetic or came here today and think that you're God's gift to the world. Wherever you are in that spectrum, God forgives you. And He bids you now to live a life of faith. He, He bids you to repent of that apathy. Right? And take up a life of faith because you are somebody in Christ. He bids you, if you think you've got it all figured out and your stuff doesn't stink, to repent. And recognize that Jesus alone is the one who is truly good. Then He bids you to go, right? And how could we not? Live and tell. St. Paul says in, in the end of this, his magisterial second chapter of his letter to the Ephesians, wherein he he tells us that we are spiritually by nature blind and dead and enemies of God, but then so that we're then saved purely as a gift of God by grace. Then tells us in verse 10 that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, to live a life of faith, Good works, which God himself prepared in advance for us to do. That is to say, the good that you do, God planned it. This very day, in fact, before you, have, before you walk out these doors, God places an opportunity for you to do good. You will go home today with the opportunity to do good. You'll go to school and you'll go to work. You'll be out in the community and recognize as those opportunities arrive, even in the midst of struggle, right? That is God at work to enable you, right, to help you live out a life of faith. This very day, this very morning, Christ has opened our ears to hear his word that we might trust in him and Him alone for our salvation, 
and that we might then live a life of faith. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand